Black was acclaimed for this three-year term. I've known David Black for a very long time. We have worked closely together since 2001 when he became the vice president for the ICDC unit. He has been the president since 2011. This is his third term. And uh, I would like you to join me in welcoming our president, David Black. Walk forward with the vice president. I guess that's a retroactive promotion. I was an executive board member in 2001, didn't become uh, vice president until 2005. But hello and welcome to our 2015 convention. First, I'd like to acknowledge the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh people on whose unceded territory we meet here today. And I want to thank you for being here and giving all of your time and effort to this union, not just for the next few days, but all the time that you've already put in and especially the time that you're going to be putting in. People have come, come here from across our province, and in fact, from across our country, in order to be here together. I'd like a show of hands now for just a moment. How many of you, this is your first convention, your first COPE 378 convention? Wow. <laughs> Members are here from all different workplaces, from the private sector to the public sector, from big companies to small companies. And you're all here to talk about how we can make our workplaces and our communities a little bit better. Your involvement in activism is the foundation for everything that we do. Over the last three years, I've had the privilege to stand on picket lines with our members at Fortis Electric, at Southern Rail, at Capilano University, and now at BCAA. In almost all of these cases, those picket lines were not the result, were not the choice of our members. In some cases, it wasn't even their dispute. Our members were out supporting other union members in their fights, and I have never been more privileged than to stand in solidarity with our members in those circumstances. As we gather here for convention, I ask you all to think about what that means. Convention, as dictated by our Constitution, is the supreme governing body of our union. It's an important event that gives us the opportunity to reflect, take stock of our activities and achievements over the last three years. But perhaps more importantly, it charts the course for where we go next. By joining and participating in our convention, you're helping to plot the future. I'm pleased to be returning for my third term as pr your president. As I scan the horizon for those three years, I see challenges coming our way. Some things never change. We continue to face employers who don't value the work that we do or our quality of life. We still have governments that don't value the role unions play as workers' advocates. They set up institutions like WorkSafe and the Labor Relations Board with anti-worker biases. You can just ask our members locked out right now at BCAA what that's all about. They have seen firsthand that when it comes to the Labor Board, the, the deck is stacked against them. However, despite that, our BCA members and this union will beat the House time and time again. I believe I know that with smart, innovative choices, we can set out a, a plan to navigate our challenges. We can do the right thing by our members and their communities and make things better for the lives we touch. In fact, we've already started. We've made some significant changes to the way the union serves our members, I believe, for the better. One of the most significant changes we've made is in training and empowering our job stewards. Job stewards have, without a doubt, the most important position in the union, much more important than my position. But at one point in our union's history, we didn't always act that way. We centralized the authority to solve problems at the union office with our union reps and our elected leadership. The people that did this meant well. But what ended up happening is that our reach and impact in the workplace was seriously weakened over time. Stewards weren't given the power, the knowledge, or the authority to be their union at work, 
to step in when things went wrong, to make positive changes for our members. When I started taking advantage of the labour education op opportunities, like Harrison Winter School, our Job Steward Seminar, weekend courses, I started meeting activists from other unions and from other bargaining units. I heard about how they had used the training that we had all received in a way that had remained largely theoretical to me. The excellent service that our union reps provided didn't leave a lot of space for me as a steward to use that training. I got to see the, the reps doing their work firsthand, sitting in on that process, but there were precious few opportunities for me to practice it as a steward. At the same time, the union reps were dealing with crushing workload, which took them away from bargaining and the more complicated arbitrations. Empowering and training our stewards is about strengthening our first line of defense and making sure that problems don't escalate. We represent smart, competent people who have detailed knowledge of their workplaces. Why not give you the power? So a couple of years ago, we invested in empowering our job stewards, the linchpin of, the, of our union. Our steward skills have been beefed up through worksite and industry-specific training, resulting in better, faster grievance management. We have the statistics to back this up. Three years ago, stewards only opened about 8% of all grievances in our union. The rest were done by union reps. Now, just a few short years later, when we've just begun the training process, they open up about 40% of all grievances are done by stewards in the workplace. This is an amazing achievement in that amount of time. <laughs> the number of overall grievances filed with the union office has gone down dramatically in 2012. Now before you think, oh, things are getting slipping through the cracks or, or even more remarkably, the employers are not mistreating our members, none of that's true. What's true is that you as the stewards and the counselors in the workplace are solving things, resolving those for members before they hit the grievance procedure, and that is the biggest victory of all. <laughs> You're doing your jobs as proactive problem solvers right there in the workplace. And when our members think of their union, they think of their local job steward. They don't think of me, they don't think of the union reps, they don't think of Lori or, or our vice presidents. They think of you right there in the workplace. But that's true now more than ever before. We know from our member polling that over the last three years, the number of members who contact stewards first compared to those who contact union staff has increased significantly. It's a very powerful testament to the way our members are stepping into their roles and being effective in their work sites and showing leadership. Now, this has freed up a bit of the reps time. But what this has allowed them to do is eliminate the backlog in bargaining and prosecute long-standing grievances and arbitrations. The, the outstanding grievances and arbitrations and quite frankly bargaining that we had a number of years ago has, has all but been eliminated and we are much better serving our members now. A further consequence of these changes is we're spending less money on lawyers and we're getting better results and we're doing it in a more timely fashion for our members. We are really doing a fantastic job and that hinges on the work that you guys are doing in the workplace, so thank you very much. Our training and education programs ensure that stewards are determined, capable, and professional advocates. And it's remarkable how you've all stepped up to the challenge and made this an overwhelming success. Thank you. Now, to be honest, it's not always easy for the union office to step back and let members and stewards take more control. But it is necessary. We draw our strengths from our members and take our cues from them as well. Therefore, we have to keep going. It's important that we recommit to top-notch member education programs and continue to find new ways to empower job stewards. Part of this means building on our successes and reimagining our member education programs. We have a long history and a very proud history of member education in COPE 378, which includes our annual job steward seminar held over three days each spring. Many of you have been there. H how many have attended one of the job steward seminars? If you haven't, I strongly encourage you to do that th uh, this coming spring. It's big, robust, very successful, and get great reviews from the people who attend. 
Members get to spend a lot of in-depth time with the facilitators. They also get to hear from some great speakers who share their knowledge about the bigger issues facing workers, both here, at home, and across the globe. We need to continue with the education programs that our members appreciate so much. At the same time, we need to plan new ways of delivering member and activist education to make it even more accessible. We've piloted shorter classes that travel to our members instead of asking our members to come to us every time. Additionally, with the expanded space in our, our new office, we can hold smaller sessions more frequently and in a less costly manner. I hope I have the opportunity over the next three days of getting your feedback on what kind of formats and topics you'd like to see. But our members' role in this union doesn't end with worksite problems. Unions are, at their core, democratic institutions. Each member of COPE 378 gets a vote on their contract and on their union leadership. But it shouldn't end there. It should only be the beginning. Look at the way that we all get involved in our communities and civic life around us. In Canada, as with the recent federal election, we each get a vote and are called on to elect leaders at the municipal, federal, and provincial levels. But there are plenty of opportunities to go deeper. There are plenty of opportunities that our members take advantage of. We know from our member polling that our members volunteer. They volunteer a lot. Many people sit on parent advisory councils or they volunteer with organizations from environmental charities to church groups to a whole myriad of other groups that work to make the world around us just a little bit better. They continue to influence the society we build together well after they've cast their ballots in any elections. In the same way that our civic rights and responsibilities don't end with general elections, we should be looking at more ways for our members to help this union uh, become better. Our Constitution sets out very clear lines of responsibility and allows for quick and decisive decision making. That's a good thing. However, as we've grown and changed, the opportunities for member involvement, rank and file member involvement, have not kept pace. As our union grew larger and more diverse, our governing bodies kept the structural and f uh, structure and philosophy of a much smaller organization that we originally were. I've heard from rank and file members that their union leadership seems very distant from their work sites. I've heard this from members in Alberta, but I've also heard it from members right here in British Columbia, right here in the Lower Mainland. So, what do we do about that? Well, first and most obviously, we need to continue getting out to our work sites. I'm very proud to say that just this fall, we succeeded in getting out to every single work site where we have members over the past three years, at least once. That may not seem like a lot, but it took many, many weeks of your executive board and your staff touring the province to achieve that. Doesn't mean that we saw everybody, because not everybody's there on the day that we get there, but we did get to every single work site. So does that mean we're done? No, it means now we start over again and go back to see them a second time. But that's not enough. I want to find ways to make our current bodies more effective so that participation in them is more meaningful. And I need your help to do that. Not everybody wants to be president or an executive board member or an executive council member or even a job steward. But as members of this union, there may be other ways that they want to get involved. We need to continue to search out those ways and open up any opportunities we might find. We need to find new opportunities for job stewards and members to get involved at the level that meets their interest and their commitment level, keeping in mind that those things change over their careers and their, their membership in this union. People want a voice, but it's fair that we figure out how that involvement can be balanced with the rest of what's going on in their lives. This isn't going to be easy, but over the next three years, I'm committing to working with our members to renew democracy in our union and develop more opportunities for meaningful membership involvement and engagement. If we're successful, we'll be even stronger. We have an opportunity to start this conversation at this convention. 
part of making this union more inclusive and welcoming to our members is by ensuring that we reflect our members. Our membership has grown increasingly diverse, which makes sense given the increasing diversity of our province and our country. However, the diversity of our staff and our elected leadership have not kept up with these changes. In order to properly represent and engage with our members and potential members, we have to share their experiences. We have to get, to, we have to get what people's lives are all about. We have to know what they face, both at work and in their communities. So, we've begun making changes. Already, the elected leadership and office staff are far more diverse when I became involved. The first few beginning steps. There's a range of different cultural backgrounds, ages, sexual orientation, and physical ab abilities. That's good, but not good enough. We have more work to do, a lot more work to do. And this is the right work to do. If we don't do this, we, we risk becoming irrelevant to more and more of our members. But more importantly than that, diversity is strength. It guards against groupthink. Studies have shown that diverse groups make better decisions than homogeneous groups. If we don't take this on in earnest, we'd be ignoring an opportunity to become a stronger and smarter organization. So, we're redoubling our efforts to identify and nurture a more representative group of leaders, and it's a lens we're applying when hiring new staff. This, is something, this isn't something that I can do on my own or that I can assign to somebody else or a committee. We need help from everyone in this room to begin conversations with our members from more diverse backgrounds. Which brings me to another issue of equity and justice. This year, the National Truth and Reconciliation Commission released its report detailing the terrible way that First Nations people in Canada have been treated. We know more about the shameful legacy of residential schools where children were abused, where they were ripped away from their families and ripped away from their cultures. In their final report, the Commission challenges all Canadians to be part of this re reconciliation. This involves educating ourselves and our institutions about the racism deeply embedded in the relationship between settler people and First Nations people ever since the colonists first came to these shores. As an organization dedicated to making positive change in our society, we have a role to play in this reconciliation. Let's not shy away from that challenge. Already, we've begun dialogue with First Nations economic development groups. We want to learn about what we can do to support opportunity for First Nations employment, to talk about the positive roles unions play in the workplace, and for economic and social justice. We've also made it clear to some of our biggest employers, like BC Hydro, that First Nations concerns must be addressed before we can support, as a union, before we can support major development projects that inf impact them. That's a good start. But even more than that, we have to recognize that as an important institution in society, unions, including our union, need to reach out in the spirit of reconciliation and talk to First Nations people about this process and experience it side by side with them. I have a plan to include our staff and council in reconciliation activities next year, which I'll talk about at our next executive council meeting. This is about respect. It's about recognizing the past. It's about moving forward. We've been presented with a historic opportunity here to repair this relationship. Let's take up that challenge. As we look at building our future, my mind naturally turns to politics. Over the last three years, we've lobbied and campaigned to secure respect from government for both our private sector and public sector members. Our governments at all levels have a direct and real impact on our members' working conditions and wages and the communities in which they live and raise their families. In the public sector, we bargain with government, that's obvious. In the private sector, government creates the playing field where we engage our employers. 
They write health and safety laws. They create the framework for pensions, which are so important for our retirement security. And they write the laws governing labor relations. They also have the power to create or deny opportunity in the private sector. We, as a union, as their union, have a clear mission and mandate. We're here for you, your family, and your community. With our members' help and guidance, we bargain collective agreements that are in the best interests and we protect those rights. We advocate for changes that will make things better for all of us. Governments that pass laws and enact policies that attack our ability to stand up for our members, that tear at our public services, and that allow the gap between the rich and the rest of us to widen cannot stand unopposed. We must continue to participate in our democracy to champion candidates who share our values and who care about our members. Some of these candidates and elected people have sat right where you're sitting here today. In COPE 378, we have a very proud tradition of fielding progressive candidates from within our own ranks. In my memory, we had Danny White, who was an executive board member and a member of the school board in the Comox Valley. We helped elect Tom Duncan to city council, and appropriately enough, Duncan, BC. We elected, helped elect Karen Rockwell and Barbara Yunker, two of our former members and current staff members, to Port Moody City Council. Corlene Carreras was elected to uh, Pitt Meadows Maple Ridge School Board. Lori Watt was elected to New Westminster School Board. And the current mayor of New Westminster, Jonathan Cote, is a COPE 378 member who was elected with a great deal of support from, from this local. <laughs> when people say that, oh, politics doesn't matter and you can't make a difference, I call bullshit on that. This, this is a proven list that you can make a difference. And I know that those people every day are advocating on behalf of our members from those positions. But beyond that, we have had strong candidates like Amadeet Niger and Lori Mayhew, who have put their names forward and have not been successful yet. <laughs> <laughs> all members or staff are make, all members or staff are making a, a mark in their communities. This is our proven track record. Having leaders from within our ranks help keep our issues on the table, whether it's transit, hydro, public auto insurance, or hasting the race course, our people that are at the table making a real difference for our members in their workplaces. Politics isn't enough. Another strategy that will help to protect our current members is growth. Unions around the world are experiencing challenges to their membership and are representing smaller and smaller proportions of the workplace. Canada is no different. Unions are either growing larger and stronger or getting smaller and less powerful. We also have a duty to share with others what we enjoy as union members. We want to extend our protection to those who need it. Our organizing department has made a conscious and successful effort to appeal to workers who see themselves in us. They share our values. We understand, we get their workplaces. We have to continue this outreach and become the union of choice for unorganized workers in new sectors of the BC economy. However, in order to do so, we have to take charge of how we are perceived by others. We have to make sure that we present ourselves, the way we present ourselves, matches our values and our mission. We want to reflect our current members, but also appeal to new members. In 2014, your executive board and council recognized that our current name, COPE, presents challenges for us. Our name, COPE, isn't memorable. Not a lot of people know what it means. I can't tell you how many times I've had to tell people when they ask what I do, and I'm the president of COPE, well, what is COPE? Are you a civic party? No, no, that's a different COPE. What is COPE? Were we a union? Oh, who do you represent? Well, we represent people at BC Hydro, ICBC, uh, transit workers, some gas workers, education workers, and then eventually you trail off and they sort of go, oh, okay, I get it, but their eyes are going, no, I don't understand who this guy is. It doesn't create the image we want to project, and I'm sure you've had many of the same experiences when trying to explain what COPE is to people. 
We've spent time listening to our members and potential members to get their ideas and thoughts. We've thought hard about who we are, what we believe in, and what we want to do. I believe this image change, which you're going to hear more about tomorrow, reflects the real change in growth that we've done over the last few years and will set the right tone for the years to come. Now, change is never easy. What is easy is sticking with what you're used to. But as Benjamin Franklin said, when you're finished changing, you're finished. Change is hard. Change is necessary. And it can be a good thing. A new name opens an opportunity to have new conversations with our current members. After this weekend, we'll go back and say, well, we're, we don't call ourselves COPE anymore. We call ourselves, you'll find out tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> no spoilers here. And, and members will ask you about that. That's an opportunity for you to talk to them about what it means to be a member of this union and where, what we believe in and where we're going. It's also a new chance to reach out to workers that don't have a union. And it's our opportunity to tell a story about our union, about all unions, a story that shows that we're open and responsive and changing with the times. However, it's not all big airy fairy things like that. To come back to more pragmatic matters, we wouldn't be able to do any of this work if this union wasn't on a very secure financial footing. Building on the legacy of current and previous leadership, our union has only become stronger in the last few years. When faced with rising costs for leasing our office space, we decided to consider other options. We found we could purchase a new space rather than continuing to make lease payments. We purchased a new location which we occupied in June. This asset, which is owned by the members, will further secure the finances of this union well into the future. We have among the lowest dues of all unions in Canada, and we should keep it that way while still managing to serve our members in the best way possible. I will continue to look at different ways to manage those funds in the interests of the members to have maximum impact while avoiding undue risk. We're in a fortunate position to think creatively and look at different ways of doing things. The past three years have already taught us how to try and test new ideas and to move forward with what works, what works best. With this knowledge, we can move forward with an optimistic plan for the future. We can continue to train smart and skilled stewards, which allow our staff the time to build stronger collective agreements. We can make internal changes to make this union more reflective of our membership and invite new members in. We can influence the world around us for the better by supporting reconciliation and by continuing to be active in our communities. Together, we're part of a movement for a fairer, more just society. I thank you for being part of it, and I'm honored and humbled to be your representative for another three years. Thank you.